So let's go. So the first part is in a dark blue, and we start the, the thing going, right? Probably let me just read over the text so that we just have the text, you know, the whole text in our mind. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works then shall be burnt up. End of quote. First color, dark blue, but the day of the Lord. Well, the first thing we need to understand with the day of the Lord is that the day of the Lord isn't a reference to a 24-hour or a sunset-to-sunset -sunset day. The day of the Lord is an event. Like we will say somebody was done an injustice and, and they say, don't worry, I'll have my day in court. It doesn't mean that the case will be tried in one single day. The case may go on for, for months in Trinidad for years, but I will have my day in court refers to the event that I would take it to court. So the day of the Lord is what we're dealing with now. The event, whether it's a, a one day thing, a 10 minute thing, uh, uh, um, a 10 week thing, it's the day of the Lord uh, in event, as an event. So we start with Acts 2.20. This is the things that's going to happen on this day. Yeah? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Notice, before, not on the day, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Sun, moon, dark, before that great and notable day of the Lord. I'm seeing some room for improvement in my highlights as I go down. I would try to do that before I send out the PDF. <clears throat> First Corinthians 5, 5. To deliver such, hold on, I need to back up. Acts 2.20, context, who is speaking is Peter. St. Peter wrote the letter, and Peter is quoting Joel, the prophet Joel, because nothing that Paul or any of these writers in the New Testament wrote was new information. They just brought back to remembrance, as Peter said, what was written by the prophets. This was Peter speaking verbally on the day of Pentecost and, he, and quoting from Joel and says, what you just said in Acts 2.20. Moving on. Paul writing now. 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He's referring to people in the, in the, in the congregation who was going contrary. And he said, don't... don't um, Leave these guys to themselves, you know, pull up on them, condemn them, judge them for yourselves, so that at least we could save their soul for the day of the Lord, right? Deliver them up to Satan, it mean, it, um, meaning to, to, to address the issues so that you could kill it in the flesh, save their spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 2. But of the times and seasons, Paul again written, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. We ain't highlighting Tifa and I because later on we, we will be dealing with that. Right now, we're just dealing with the day of the Lord. The point so far from these three texts and a couple more is that this day of the Lord was the topic on everyone's tongue at that point in time. They weren't thinking about something thousands of years in the future. This was something imminent that they were to be aggressively preparing 
themselves for. Here is where they got it from. Joel 1.15, alas, the day for the day of the Lord. Notice it says it twice. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord. That is like saying, verily, verily. This is emphasis. This is the only time in the Old Testament that this is used twice because there are many other day of the Lords. But this particular one is emphasized by repeating it twice because of, of course, the obvious emphasis. This is the day, as the, you know, the, the, as we know from the British slash war with, with Germans and so on, <clears throat> well, the world against Germany, D-Day. This is the day of the Lord. And what does it say about it in Joel? It says it is at hand. Now, Joel wrote this prophecy years ago. When Joel wrote it, it wasn't at hand, but he wrote is at hand because it wasn't a prophecy for Joel, just like Daniel who wrote and the Lord told him, seal it up, it's not for you. Joel, as the Bible says, these prophets looked intently to see when the, the um, fulfillment of their prophecies, what they were writing would be. But that wasn't for them. It was for us, Peter says. And this is one such prophecy. Joel would have looked intently. When is this day coming? But it wasn't for him. It was at hand based on the timing that Peter brought the prophecy into, into, into the scene. Jesus didn't bring it in. It was Peter who brought it in, in the day of Pentecost. He said, this is what the prophet Joel was talking about, and the rest is history. So from that time on, this prophecy is at hand. As a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Joel 2.1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm. An alarm, alarm is urgency. In my holy mountain in Jerusalem, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh, it is at hand. Guys, if this, as Peter repeated, this is what you know, Prophet Joel spoke and so on and so on. It's 2,000 years down the road. Well, I don't know what at hand. That is a real long hand. You know, it does have a short hand, a long hand, and a clock. That hand too long. Joel 2.31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Matthew 24, 29 to 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Jesus, talking forward here now, in Matthew, the, uh, the Olivet Discourse, as it is referred to, telling his four disciples what was to come, says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, which he had just explained all the drama that would have taken place, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon not give her light, and the stars fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, Jesus, and only Jesus could do this. He adds to what Joel said, because as you tell Joel, the prophecy in the first place. But of course, he's referring to the same prophecy. Just like he did with Daniel. When earlier up in, in Matthew 24, he says, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Daniel that their time of trouble will come as never was, and then he adds, and never will be again. When you go and you read it in Daniel, you see the time of trouble as never was. But Jesus adds the words, and will never be again. And it's the same thing he's done with the prophet Joel's prophecy. He talks about the sun going dark, and the moon will not give light, and he adds, the stars will fall, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And he goes on, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. So what did Joel say? These things will happen before the notable day of the Lord. Here Jesus saying it, all these things will happen, and then will appear the sign of the Son of Man. So Jesus coming is the notable day of the Lord, that particular day that he's coming back. 
the sun of mine in the heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, of course, we, we've studied this many times, but just to highlight, when he was leaving, the angel said, ye men and brethren, same apostles that Jesus is talking to here right now, he's coming back in like manner. Jesus had already told them that in Matthew 24 in the Oliver Discourse. And yet today, there are people who believe that Jesus came secretly. Some, they, they, some who believe he came secretly before, some who talking about a secret rapture that coming sometime future. No, this was him coming in the clouds as he said he would. But the picture that we have in our mind is, you know, people floating up into the heavens and, you know, the... The, the dead first and then the, the, the others uh, going up to meet them. But what we miss is that Paul said that this will happen in a twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, bodies change up in the air, everybody going. So speed up, your, speed up your projection image in your mind, guys. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean blink. And that, and uh, you know, when he says in the twinkling of an eye, I think he's trying to show that it is a fast process and not necessarily taking literally that as your blink, it happened. As I was studying this this week, the thought came, came, came to me that you remember that Peter was told he will not live to see the return. He, he was told how he's going to die. And as a matter of fact, he talks about it in these letters, in this letter, in chapter two, in the second letter, sorry, he says that, you know, he, as the Lord had told him, is expecting his imminent death anytime soon. What hit me is this. Paul said, the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus told Peter, you are the head I'm leaving you in charge. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep three times. And I am leaving you because God gave you this revelation that I am the rock. Upon you, I'm going to continue the extension of this, this, um, this building, this temple. Isn't it marvelous that Peter had to die? Because if the dead in Christ had arise first, then Peter was one of the first in the air. And then Paul, who lived, I believe, because he said, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the air. Paul now brings up the rare, the rare God. It's just a picture I have floating in my, in my uh, image floating in my head because of putting this, this study together. Because it's only right that whoever was left in charge would have the honor of raising up first or being, you know, first to see Jesus face to face and everybody else follow. And Paul, who was born out of time and the last of the apostles, brings up the rear with all the Gentiles and everybody else. It's just a beautiful scene. <sighs> but also, any blinking of an eye, very quick scene. Amos 5, 18 to 20 says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Okay? Woe unto you who wishing for the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even the very dark and no brightness in it. Again, Amos is repeating this thing over and over to give the emphasis. They didn't have exclamation marks. And if you read, when you read the, 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 the chapter, you will see that the people were bad. And Amos was saying, all you're going on like bhajan, and all you call all yourself waiting for the day of the Lord? For the, the, it wouldn't be good for you guys. So I don't understand why it is you looking out for it. Zephaniah 
to trees us, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So clearly, the day of the Lord is a day of vengeance and anger and so on. However, if those people followed what Zephaniah is saying, and this wasn't referring to, to the D day of the Lord, this was another one, when Zephaniah spoke, it may be that ye will be um, hid from all that terrible shenanigans on the day of the Lord if you seek meekness and righteousness, etc. Malachi, our last text in this section says, 4 5. Behold, I will send Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He, Malachi doesn't call it twice, doesn't say the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, like um, Amos said, not Amos, uh, uh, the, prefer, the previous text. He doesn't say it twice. He says, he calls it the great and dreadful day of the Lord, because this is D-Day, D one of ones. And how do we know where this text comes into place? Malachi wrote this, you know, hundreds of years before, but Jesus comes and says, guys, no, in fact, they asked him, Jesus, didn't our, one of our prophets, obviously referring to Malachi, say that Elijah, the prophet, must come first before the, the Messiah, the Christ, and Jesus answered them, "Well, if you would, uh, if you would have me um, or believe me, I'm, I will let you know that he did come first, and that prophet is John the Baptist. Elijah had already gone up in a chariot of fire to heaven. Well, they're sending him back down here to go through troubles again. That would be so wicked." God is not a wicked God. But the word Elijah could have been interpreted any which way hadn't Jesus made it very clear who he was referring to. So he was more talking in the spirit of Elijah when Malachi wrote this rather than the physical prophet Elijah coming back. Okay, time stamp. Jesus said, Elijah that Malachi was talking about is John the Baptist. And if John the Baptist had to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, obviously those two events are related. Well, John the Baptist was beheaded thousands of years ago. And if the day, great and dreadful day of the Lord is what we refer to as the end of the world, I can't see how it could be related in one sentence. So that is the first phrase in dark blue. Anybody wants to add, delete, comment, question? David, when you, when you were talking about Peter, you know, um, for me, if I was there in that day, every time I see Peter die, I know here what? It's just a, it ain't far again. Because Christ told him that he would die. Peter expected it. And um, it's beautiful how it, the picture is painted that imagine Peter arise first and meet Christ in the air. And he gets to watch the fruits of his labor. Everybody else coming up to meet Christ. Mm. And then Paul, as you say, pulling up the rear, he gets he comes up with the rest and presents them. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful picture. You're very, very beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Your turn. What happened? I was talking just now, and I well <laughs> muted off. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I you like know, it. Uh, I like your your um, thumbnail, by the way. Who? Your silver fox thumbnail that you finally got. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your picture is showing now when you're yeah, not yeah. when your camera off. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. I am. Um, I perceive that this day of the Lord appears in different ages. And along with it, I see that same 
darkening of the, the sun and, and the moon and that sort of stuff on each occasion. So in, in, in their the disciples' day, this day of the Lord, that will be at his second coming. Yes. And we have a day of the Lord in like manner and the third. Definitely. Correct? You're co correct, but it's, but it's not in Second Peter chapter 3. Hmm. Well, no, no, that, that, that was talking about the, um, second. the second coming. Yes. The second coming. Yes. But, but it, it could be a sort mm -hmm. of a, a repetition, like like what I was calling modus operandi as far as his appearance is concerned in any age. C certainly. We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that when we reach the Revelation chapter 20. Okay. Yeah? The third coming. When we, when we deal with that, it will be Revelation chapter 20 from around verse eight or nine, somewhere there. But for, for all that we've read, and this, guys, this is just a sampling. You, if you do a, a word check, you will see, you know, you, you'd have enough dear the Lords. It wasn't just... Um, a one single particular day in the history of... Um, yeah, anytime the Lord set up, and it wasn't only for Israel. You'll see that when he decided I come in for Babylon, it was the day of the Lord. Right, when, right. When he was coming for, for Egypt, was the day of the Lord, and so on and so on. So, and David, uh -huh. even the flood, that was a notable day. day that of on the that Lord. day, and on that, that day, he gave us that major clue as yeah. to what is going to be reserved. It's not water, but the earth mm -hmm. is going to be reserved for fire. Correct. So, yeah. Right. So, first one down, first phrase down. The day of the Lord is not referring to the third coming, which we are expecting, but rather an imminent and expecting day that the first century Christians and believers were focused on. All right. The next phrase is will come, so the day of the Lord, now, purple will come as a thief in the night. And the term that we hear all the time in church and so on, when especially with relate, where it relates to with who no man knows the day and the hour and so on, because it's a thief in the night, mean nobody knows nothing. Let's look at the Bible. Matthew 24, 42 to 43 is where it was most famously said. In the same Olivet Discourse, Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched or look out for him and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Jesus didn't stop by saying, I'm coming as a thief in the night and then leave it to them. He said, if you're watching your house, it, he wouldn't come like no thief in night and break up your house and you are asleep. Know that. First Thessalonians 5, 2, 4. For, ye, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Paul writing to primarily Gentiles and a Jewish congregation here and telling them, all you done know this already. This is thing they discussed. We talk about Jesus said it that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It coming as a thief in the night doesn't mean we don't know when it's coming, is what Paul is saying. It's not going to overtake us as no thief. Like Lisi just said, it, a big clue to them would have been when Peter died, all these were little... Um, Hansel and Gretel crumbs that they would be following because for them it wasn't as a thief. Please note that. Revelation 3.3. 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. Only if you're not watching. He's talking to one of the churches. I think it's Tartyra here in 3.3. 3. I could be wrong, but 
one of these seven churches, okay? Um, if you're not watching, then I will come on you as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come on thee. Obviously, we can glean from that statement from the words of Jesus himself through his Holy Spirit to the seven churches that if you're watching, then yet it wouldn't be as a thief event. Revelation 6.15. Behold, I come as a thief. Jesus again saying it. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. For those who watch in for the Lord, you wouldn't be found naked. Naked is, is, a, is, a, is like a, a visual of what happened with Adam and Eve when they sinned. They were naked. But God came and clothed them. And so did Jesus come and clothe all the believers in his righteousness. And once you have on the clothe of righteousness, I come in as a thief, wouldn't be finding you naked. You will have your clothes on and not find you in the bathroom. Matthew 24, 36, 39. Same Olivet discourse continuing. But in that day and hour, knoweth no man. No, not the angels in heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah, before the flood, you know, they were eating and drinking and blah, blah, blah. And then it ends up. And nobody knew nothing until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Guys, let's just revisit this text again before we pass on this, this section. We use this to say, nobody will know nothing because as in the day of Noah and all that. Let's look at it. Jesus said to, or God said to, to Noah in Genesis, Noah, in 120 years, I am going to bring a flood. Now, that sounds like a long time for you, but remember that Noah lived hundreds and hundreds of years, okay? I am going to bring a flood, Mr. Noah. This flood took place in Noah's five, 600 years, 600 years. <laughs> so, that is, so, so 120 years are drop in the bucket for Noah. Okay. Then, seven days before the flood, Jesus said, the ark is finished. And, my, and guys, it didn't take 120 years to build no ark. Eh? Go and read the book of Jubilees. Five years is what it took to build the ark. Good. Um, then it said that Jesus came and said, or God came, God or Jesus, it could have been any one of them. And the more I read the Bible, is the more I realize Jesus was the one who was speaking most of the time in the Old Testament. Um, remember that he's the one who created this world, and by him all things were created, and etc. etc. First John, I mean not first John, John 1. Right? So 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 what I say, Jesus or God? Of course, at that time he wasn't named Jesus, so it could be technically wrong. So I must stick with God. God came and told Noah, in seven days' time, I'm going to bring the rains. So you and your family and all the animals, time to come in. So while for all the masses and passes, I don't know how many people were living on the, on the planet at that point in time, for them it was like a thief in the night. It wasn't so for Noah. Knew, Noah knew exactly the day. He probably didn't know the hour, but he certainly knew the day. Seven days time. And he was inside. God sent an angel to close the door. And the rest is history. So stop using this text to say nobody can know when Jesus is coming. At least, you know, put it in the ballpark. He had given enough information. And I'm still referring to the second coming, eh? not third one. We are talking the third one, talking the second one. Stop saying that no man know the hour and stop. Continue reading the text. Didn't Noah know the time and the, and the day? Or the day? Of course he did. And likewise, all who would be ready and looking for God and Jesus' second return in the clouds in that era 
would have had enough information to put them in the ballpark. Number one, it had to happen in our generation. And, and there's so much more information. So guys, let's stop with the nonsense about nobody know the day and the once, and, and then we cut off the rest of the, the chapter like if it doesn't exist. Of course, those who are looking for the Lord would have been ready and waiting and not caught with their pants down. So that ends the purple section on the coming as a thief any night. Comments, concerns, questions, or move on. So far, loud and clear. Nice. Third section, color-coded goal, heaven shall pass away. These are the more difficult ones. Now, if we refer into the second coming, and the last time I checked, the heaven was still there, then up we'll have morning. a problem. Yeah. Well, actually, it's up to yesterday for me. I didn't go outside this morning. In fact, I did. Yes, I did go outside. So, yeah, last time I checked this morning, it was still there. So, let's see how we're dealing with this one. Phrase number three, heaven shall pass away. <clears throat> My, don't mind if I repeat in text, guys, just to get the emphasis is where the, when we reach it, right? So, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And now we have, and the stars shall fall from the heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Certainly, like a heaven passing away. Isaiah 2, 1 to 2, 12, 19, and 21 says, the word that Isaiah, the son of of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Notice, this is not the great and dreadful day of the Lord because when we're talking about that time, it is Israel, one sheep, one fold. Isaiah, who wrote in the days of King Hezekiah and so on and so on, had prophecies for down the road and he had prophecies for their time. This is one for, well, I'll let the information speak for itself. Let me just say what for. Right. He goes on to say, for Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days, notice, in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. I had to re regress and correct myself. I was thinking of another prophecy. This, as you can hear and see, is certainly about one time and one time only, the last days. Continuing on. For the day of the Lord of hosts, which is the same day of the Lord, shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. <clears throat> when he ariseth to shake the earth terribly, to go into clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake the earth terribly. This is a text that is used a lot in the second coming messages that we hear in churches. Particularly Adventists use this about, the, I think is the time of Jacob's trouble, if I'm not mistaken, when, you know, we'll be hiding rocks and mountains, but then there'll come a point when now the, the, bad, the people, the bad people now will, will be running and hiding and saying, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And they use this, 
in that context. But the first problem we have is this, and let me correct myself just now there because this is very important. Israel came back as one nation in, under one shepherd, as Jesus said. That is crystal clear. It didn't matter where they were scattered. As far as God was concerned, he has one shepherd, one fold, one sheep. But if we remember in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said two places to stay away from, well, to run away from before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He said, when you see what the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which was when you see Jerusalem, according to Luke, being surrounded by the armies, head out, get as far away from this place, from both Judah and Jerusalem as you can. He didn't stay, stay, stay only in Ju Ju Jerusalem. He said in Judah and Jerusalem. And as we know from history, from Josephus, when Vespian and Titus came to destroy Jerusalem, they didn't come to Jerusalem. They sacked every city in Judah on the way down. They started from Caesarea and methodically worked their way down to Jerusalem. Not a city was not wiped off the map. So obviously, Jesus, who knew that from long and in front, said, go run to Judah, you know, guys. Run. Well, we know from history again that they went to Pella, across the river. Don't stay anywhere in this region. And so Isaiah, seeing this prophecy, refers to it as a prophecy that will take place in the last days. Here we are today, 2021. We casually, and I say we, not talking about ourselves, but churches, you know, casually refer to the last days as our days. So every day I pick up the newspaper, we in the last days, we in the last days. Okay, yes, we in the last days, but not in the last days that the Bible was talking about. The Bible was talking about the last days of that age. And this, of course, will be followed up with text, okay? So, the day of the Lord, Isaiah is referring to the same day, and he talks about they would, um, our, our, our key um, highlight now is the gold ones, heaven and it will pass away. And here it is we see in running to the rocks and mountains when the earth started to shake terribly and so on. Following up, Isaiah 3, sorry, 34, 4 to 5 and 8. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all the hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off from the vine and the filling of the fig. And as the falling, sorry, fig from the fig tree. It's like, I think we see tumultuous. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Eduma. Eduma. Another word for that is Edom, the country of Edom. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. The word controversy, cause of Zion. Here is a prophecy from, so first we read a prophecy for the last days in Isaiah, now we're reading another prophecy, Isaiah 34. Not for the last days. There isn't even a place named Edom on the, Edom on the map anymore. Edom was destroyed a long time ago. And why? Because of what they did to Zion. God said, I'll deal with That is always the case. And no matter what it, how bad Jerusalem was, anybody touched the apple of his eyes was dealt with. And Edom has no, they didn't get away. 
Edom didn't get away. All right, they were no um thing from exemption. They were not exempt. As we know, the history of Edom is that they were cousins to Israel. And when you go back in the history to Esau, but here they are dealt with. But more importantly, what we're dealing with is what is in gold, guys. The host of heaven shall be dissolved. Isn't this very much the same language as in 2 Peter chapter 2, sorry, chapter 3, verse 10? The same language. The host of them will be dissolved and the heaven will be rolled back like a scroll and everything fallen and so on and so on. Well, if that happened physically, literally, when the day of the Lord of God's vengeance for Edom took place, then what sky it still have left to be rolled up like a scroll now, or even in the second coming? You, you, you all seen this point? This is Edom. I want us to catch it. This is not a prophecy about Israel. Not a prophecy for the last days. It was a day of the Lord's vengeance for Edom, and it took place. There's nothing that by the, that God predicts uh, prophesies that doesn't come to pass. One star. Let's think about it. Or let's just say, even if the moon, the moon is the closest body to us, if that fell to this earth, the earth will be non-existent. Far more for if the moon. Pluto, Venus, Mercury, Saturn, and all the others start to fall on the Earth. The Earth's smaller than them to begin with. This is not literal talk, guys. This is God's prophetic language. It is the way he speaks. And we see this example here for proof pudding. It didn't fall then, and it ain't going to fall now. Continuing on. Hebrews 12, 26 to 29. Whose voice then shook the earth. So Hebrews is talk, um, whoever wrote Hebrews, watch this here because he is quoting a prophet of old. So listen carefully with this one whose voice then shook the earth. But now he had promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. Now, this sounds as if whoever wrote Hebrews is saying this to the, to the Jewish people. Of course, Hebrews is written to the Jews, right? But he's actually quoting, guys. And I'll continue to read, and then we'll do the quote, right? And... This word, yet once more, signify it, the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So the author of Hebrews not only quotes the text, but explains it. And he says, the language is figurative, guys. Let me explain it for you all. This thing about the heavens shaking and so on, and yet once more I'll shake the earth and so on, this is what it means. It means that all the things that could be shaken will be, will be shaken out so that what we will be left with is the solid only things that could, it's like the house built on the, on the rock. All who build house on sand, it will wash away, but the rock will not be shaken. Wherefore, we, he includes himself, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, I've highlighted there Daniel 7.22. Daniel 7.22 simply says that the saints would inherit the earth. Remember, in the same fourth kingdom, when the beasts that finished get on with them for three and a half years, etc., that they were to inherit the kingdom of God. 
here, the author of Hebrews is saying, we who are going to inherit, we who are receiving this kingdom, this is not an earthly kingdom. This is a kingdom from God, cut out with a rock with his own hands um, from heaven. This cannot be shaken. Everything else, Jerusalem, the temple, all them things will be shaken. And he is saying, the text that he's quoting, which we are going to now, just Haggai 2, 5 to 9, was referring to that. Let's read Haggai 2, 5 to 9. According to the word that I have co covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus said the Lord of hosts, yet once, I put more in brackets there. Guys, you could go back and check your text in your Bible and your Strong's and so on. You will see that most modern Bibles put yet once more because it actually means yet once more. But the King James has yet once. This is the text that the author of Hebrews was quoting. So if you read only yet once, it doesn't see the link. It is yet once more. It is the same text. He's quoting a text. He's quoting Haggai. So, so you do your own diligence, do your research on it. Don't take my word for it. it. It will normally have a little letter like R or L or something. And when you click on it, you'll see yet once more. Right. For thus said the Lord of hosts, yet once more, it is a little while, little while, not a phrase that we could get into, but not today, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. Notice it's the same text quoted here. Yet once more, I will shake the earth, and not only the earth, but the heaven, and he moves on and explains what the text means. He didn't quote word for word and continue with the text, but it is the same text he's quoting. And there was no need. Because when these people are talking, they know exactly what he's referring to when he starts off the text. Same thing Jesus did. Jesus never quoted, well, he did a few times, but most of the time he wouldn't quote the whole, whole text and all. I just started off. The person Elijah he's talking about is, is John the Baptist, and he moves on. Things like that. So I hope you all see any connection. Haggai 259 is what is quoted in Hebrews 12. And continuing on, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, said the Lord of hosts. This is so refreshing, eh? Because we, when we hear the shaking and the, and and whatever have you, we see only negative connotations, and yet Haggai was given this prophecy in a positive statement, and that is the same treatment that the author of Hebrews gave to it. Lest you missed it, I'm just going to su summarize it. This yet once more. And a little while, and the heavens and earth will be shaken. Look what he says before it. According to the word that the Lord has covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. This is from since the first covenant. So my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. Now he's not talking to, the, to, to Haggai and them there. No? This is down the road because Hebrews quoting it and saying what it means. For thus said the Lord, who, yes, once and he shaken and he shaken. Then he says, the glory of the latter house. To put this into context, Haggai and those prophets were writing at the time when they had just returned from Babylon after the 70 years prophesied by Jeremiah. And the temple was, the reconstruction of the temple had begun. And the old men who had seen what the first one looked like, you know, Solomon's own, I mean, they just had to read Kings and you'll see, wow, Kings and Chronicles. That was just an amazing, you know, 21-story building. 
to give you a reference to that, the Hyatt Hotel is 21 stories. That is what the, you know, what the most holy place looked like when Solomon was finished with it. And of course, decked with gold from top to bottom, etc. It was amazing. So these people, not the young people who didn't see it in past, but the older people were crying and so on and saying, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is like nothing compared. And this is when this prophecy comes in and talks about the latter, the glory of the latter will be greater. Well, guys, for many years, I thought that this referred to, you know, Jesus when he came into the, because of course, Herod's temple was magnificent. I mean, when not the one what they had built, not Ezra's temple, but when Herod finished um, renovated, in fact, it, it didn't even finish in Herod's lifetime. It continued reno renovations until um, six years six years before it was destroyed. It continued building it at the time when Jesus was there. They say forty six years this thing had been renovated, and you come in to destroy it and build it back in three days, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so Herod's renovations took some time. But even at the time when Jesus was here, we know from the same Olivet discourse. But sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples drawing his attention to these magnificent buildings. History has it that you could be coming from miles away and will see Jerusalem gleaming in the sky like a sun, like the sun, because on top of this mountain had these white stones, and when the sun hit it, it would reflect and so on and so on. It was a magnificent, it was one of the, 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 the um, most admired buildings of the ancient world not just for the Jews, but for everybody else. It was, you know, uh, everybody else coveted the, Jew, the temple in Jerusalem. And so one would ask, but the glory of the latter will be greater. Did it mean that because he made it so fancy and all that? No. Did it mean because Jesus came and walked in it? That's what I thought. No. The temple here, when we see the word latter, we always think, well, sometimes we, 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 we put it together and get it right that it is the last. And sometimes we say latter as the King James have it. But click on your word or go into your manual strongs or whatever, and you'll see that that word there is the last. It could be translated latter, last. It doesn't matter. It's still the last. It's not the glory of that temple that they were building will be greater. That is the one that Jesus said, behold, your house is left unto you, desolate. The glory of that wasn't greater. When Jesus was walking this earth, Jesus said, my glory, hadn't, I haven't yet been glorified. It's only after the cross. Jesus was glorified on, the, on, the, uh, on his death and resurrection. So him walking through the temple, even though it's God walking through the temple, he didn't bring any glory to it. The glory of the last house shall be greater than the former. Which is the last house, guys? The last temple, and this, the word house there is temple. Eh? The glory of the last temple is the temple that Jesus became, the, the stone that the builders rejected, became the chief corner, and then started with the apostles building brick by brick, and everybody else who became believers, including us, um, forming the last temple of God. And it is the glory of the last temple that will be greater than the former. The temple that God, Jesus has, that Jesus set up, only righteousness, only saints, everybody in it, cut, proper, and fit. That is the temple that um, Haggai was referring to, the last temple. Revelation 6, 12 to 14 and 17. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of the heaven fell unto the earth, when even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, 
when she is shaken of a mighty wind and the heaven departed and as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places for the great day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand Remember in Matthew, it said before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, all these things would happen. So, taking a deep breath here, guys, because we've been reading a lot about the stars falling, the earth trembling, the, the thing rolled together. Hebrews author has made it clear to us that it is not literal. It is referring to what could be shaken, will be shaken, and what will stand, will stand. He made it very clear. But what is this really all about? Not by interpretation, but rather go back, let's go back to the Bible and see what it's all about. Here is the, <laughs> this one maybe may blow your minds away, maybe. Here's the connection. Daniel 8, 9 to 11, 16 to 17, 19, 23 to 24. Of course, I divide it up because for time's sake, feel free to go and read over the whole chapter of Daniel chapter 8, which is the prophecy with the goat and the sheep. And the whole one, the last one, the, 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 you know, representing Medo Persia and Greece, etc. Let's see where this goes. This Guys, is the explanation of explanations given by the angel, not by David Buffon. Here we go. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land, which is Israel. The out, I just want to put the context so I wouldn't lose anybody. This is the goat who had the one horn that ravished the, the sheep with the ram with the two horns. And then the one horn broke off and four horns came up. And this is where we pick up the story. So, and out of one of the four came a little one, exceeding wax and great and so on, right? Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called out and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Note, guys, I'm skipping verses. Eh? So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for the time of the end shall be division. Not the end of time, the time of the end, which is the time of the end of the age, which is also referred to as the last days, latter days. This is when this vision shall come to pass. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. You see how God operates? Appointed times. We're talking about you know, let me see if we could get Jesus to come faster or the third, second government to come faster. And what, God has an appointed time for everything. And at the time appointed, the end shall be. And in the latter time, same thing, last time, latter time, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenances and dark understanding and dark sentences, sorry, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. 
my mind just went off a little bit there because I forgot to mention that we are now into the explanation of division. So we saw the ram goat and the this and that. And of course, he already said the part with the Persia and uh, Medo Persia and so on. We, we skipped through all that and we are focusing on what the stars and the host was. Here we go. And his power shall be mighty, not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and here in goal and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. Right. These guys, if you didn't catch it, I'm going to repeat it. This little horn that got much more mighty than all the others shake up yourself and get on bad and you know understanding dark sentences and so on and so on he's gonna rise up he's a bad king he fears countenance etc etc but what is his mission to destroy mighty and holy people in case you missed it we'll go back to the part of the vision that the angel is explaining this horn wax great even to the host of heaven, and it casts down some of the host and the stars to the ground. Now, King James and there, they put it in. Let me remove it for you guys so it will make more sense. And it casts down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground. The shaking of the stars and the falling of the stars the angel's interpretation is that they are the mighty and holy men. This is people, the star boy and them, if you want, for Trinidad language. I.e., all the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the high priests and the priests and everybody who feel they were better than Jesus and better than God. Their day was coming. And God used this mighty fierce king to come for them notice the language that his power was he was powerful but not by his own power all you had to do is read Gen revelation 13 the beast didn't have his own power the dragon gave the beast the power second thessalonians talking about this man who would sit in god's temple and feel he's god and da 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 Referring to, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but people who deal with principalities and powers who are controlled by principalities and powers and rulers in, in high places. I'll go on a little further than I, than I wanted to go there. I, I'm trying to keep this thing simple. So, stop that for me. So, clearly, the heavenly bodies, i.e. the stars in particular, fall into the earth and shake off, is, is defined in prophetic language in Daniel chapter 8 and explained by the angel, Gabriel of all angels, a named angel, not just any angel, angel Gabriel, go and explain this prophecy to Daniel. And it's here for us so that we could read it. So when we see the stars falling from the heaven, it is the mighty men who are being trodden underfoot and who are being destroyed is what it refers to. That's why it says, before the notable day of the Lord, the, before the day that Jesus came is when they were destroyed, A.D. 70. Questions, comments, concerns? See my hand up on this thing. Yes. Um, <clears throat> no, David. When you um, began this section, what came to mind is Joseph. Joseph's dream. And we had, you had done a lesson with us pertaining to who the sun, the moon, and the stars were. So we see from the beginning, God gave an explanation 
And so you've continued, you have consistently said that the, these words in the hands of the Jews is nothing for them to grasp and understand because they would have had that kind of understanding from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that we see that from the beginning, God gave an explanation and he continued to speak in the language that he spoke when he spoke, when he showed Joseph that dream. And yes, the sun, moon and stars, I agree very much pertains to people. So each time we are reading and, <laughs> you know, as we learned in religion, they've been telling us that is, and you're expecting that the sky would no longer be there. But in, in our group, Sam and I say, but it's still there. It hasn't changed. And even when you were talking about Edom, I'm saying in my mind, well, then the sky that we have today isn't really the sky that we're supposed to have, but that doesn't make sense. The only thing it refers to is people as Joseph got. And then when it pertains to removing the things that can be shaken, the thought that came to my mind, and I will stand corrected, is what could have been shaken is the covenant and the law because the people were unable to actually follow it. Those things were... They, they weren't, but this under the new covenant with Christ, where he writes it in our heart and we are empowered through his Holy Spirit. These are the things that cannot be shaken. It cannot be removed because what the spirit of God places in you cannot be taken out, you know, because it's built on a firm foundation, as you pointed out, on the rock, Christ Jesus. And in the linkage of it, in linking us to being the temple, the temple of God, it's, it's amazing because it means that the temple of God has dominated the entire world. It means that everywhere you turn in every vicinity, God's presence is there in all of us. He, he owns the world and he's dominating the world. This is the new kingdom, not, sat not situated in one place, but situated everywhere and saturating the entire world. Entire world. Yes. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for the the reminder of the um, Jacob Joseph. Joseph connection, because yes. I actually when I was doing putting it together, I, I forgot that piece. I know we right. had we had done it before, but I forgot yes. it. With otherwise, I'd have highlighted it today. So thanks for bringing that back, because guys, that is like that is the first link to the stars thing. That is actually right. the first first one. The last one is in Revelation um, twelve, where the the woman made the child and had the crown with the 12 stars in her head, referring again to the children of Israel. But the first yeah. one was when Joseph had the dream and when his father and his okay. brothers it's asked Genesis. him about who, who it was. Yeah, it's Genesis 37, 9. And it says, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obstinance to me. Yeah. That's, and so yeah. and then his brothers were so angry. Well, I think that was the one that broke the camel's back. Yeah. From that day on, they were just like, kill him. When will you get him? <laughs> just catch him yeah. in the dark and kill him. Right? Because he, of course, was one of the stars. So the other eleven would make would bow down to him. And 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 indeed that prophecy was fulfilled. And so Amen. from since then, the language of the stars was used to refer to the children of Israel and continues straight throughout all prophecies. And today, every time, I mean, let's just be real. Yeah. We have, in church, we, 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 we get the picture of the stars falling, literally, you know, those okay. big giant items in the heavens, which are bigger than earth falling and crashing into it which makes absolutely no sense when you think about it and worse sense when you see how many times in the bible i only use the one with edom and have more it, how many times this has happened before yeah we are the light of the world as jesus Amen. said to them that they are the light of the world as israel was supposed to be even before jesus came they were supposed to be the light of the world just like how Moses had light up when he come down from the mountain. It's people, the, the Israelites, that were to give praise to God. So I'm glad that so far we're getting it. That's um, the goal section done with there. You had mentioned about the about the 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 the, 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 the laws and so on and so on. That piece is coming in now. The the the, the this part with 
the heavens and so on. That is not the laws. That is the people, the Israelites, who were going to be um, cast down. Yes, we, I agree. And, right? We're now going to deal with the laws and things now. When it comes to the elements shall melt with fervent heat. <laughs>